Chris Reed student, that's why I'm standing right now. Um, so the project that I'm going to present to you is um, an ongoing work. We try to publish it as quickly as possible. It is from the time before I started my PhD in Lausanne, when I was working together with um, Ilka Heemskerk and Javier Garcia Bernardo uh, from the University of Amsterdam. The title is The Wealth Defense Industry, Accountancy Firms and the Making of Cor Complex Corporate Structures. Um, to give you some background to how we came up with that question, what you see here is the top marginal corporate tax rates over all countries, and you see that in 1980, on average, companies were taxed at the rate of 45%, whereas today, um, that rate dropped, and it's at 20 to 25%. On top of that, you, we see that companies develop quite sophisticated strategies in, in lowering their tax rates even further. For example, you probably all know, um, Apple was accused of paying less than 0.005% on their um, global profits. Okay, this is how the story would usually be t being told. That's how you would usually hear about stories of tax competition and tax avoidance. And what we argue is that when we tell the story like that, we miss out on an important point. We miss out on all of these actors that are, that are actually in between companies and regulators. Um, and we name them the wealth defense industry. Um, yeah, so we have seen recent um, shifts in attention towards these actors, such as in the, in the LuxLeaks. Um, it became prominent that PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, an accountancy firm, was was crucial to establish deals between companies and the, the tax authorities of Luxembourg. The, t the wealth defense industry is composed of very different and various actors. We focus on one of them, and namely the accountancy firms. So the question is, to what extent are accountancy firms involved in, as involved in tax avoidance? How do they act as supply suppliers of wealth defense? And what we did is we looked at the influence of accountancy firms on corporate structures that we can assume to be related to tax avoidance um, practices, not only, but also. I'd say, so I hope I convinced you that it's important to look at the actor in between. Now I'll give you some more arguments on why we look at accountancy firms. Why are they important? So one thing which is intriguing about accountancy firms is that they have, they have been subject to quite a strong transformation over time. Whereas um, traditionally, their core business activity was audit provision, which is basically checking the financial accounts of companies and giving a full and fair view as an independent um, actor on these accounts. And in economic theory, this um, practice would be judged as enhancing economic stability. The accounting firms are there with, and they provide um, transparency to an economic system which improves investment decisions. The point is that today accounting firms are not really auditors anymore. 36% of their income is from audit work and the rest comes from tax and consulting services. <coughs> <laughs> Another point why it's interesting to look at the accountancy firms is their sheer size. So on the right, you see these statistics from The Economist from 2015. On the right-hand side, you see the revenue of law firms in 2014. And on the left side, you see the revenue of accountancy firms. And the, sca the scale is the same, right? So you see the difference. Okay. Now, I'll get into the research design and into the results. We built up this paper on a paper that was published in 2018 by Cobham, Tamuri, and Jones. Um, and we extended the range of features studied. So we used the Orbis data, and we had access to around 28,000 um, parent companies and their entire uh, subsidiary network. Um, so that really everyone gets what we did. We did regression models where we looked at how companies differ in their corporate structures according to their auditor. And there we looked at 
big four audited companies versus companies that are audited by any smaller uh, auditor, like BDO. Um, and then we looked at the corporate structures of these companies, because obviously it would be better to look at the fees and look at what exactly the, um, the um, or, or accounting firms sell to these companies, but there's no information about that. So looking at the corporate structure is like uh, entering by the back door. Um, and the corporate structures we looked at are localization strategies. So how many subsidiaries are placed in sync offshore financial centers? How many of them are placed in conduit offshore financial centers, such as Switzerland? Um, and then we looked at corporate forms. So how many of the subsidiaries are holding companies? How many of them are management companies? And as a third feature, we looked at the general complexity of the corporate structure. So the, the depth, no, yeah, depth, width, and um, now we added also entropy. Um, how much time do I have? Four minutes. Okay, I'll skip that one. And um, these are the main results. What you see here are the uh, coefficients of the auditor effect. So what you can basically imagine is behind each of these lines is a regression model. And we, um, we ran the regression by co while controlling for the size of the company, um, the place of incorporation, the sector, and the age. So, and this is then the influence of the auditor if we control for all of these other things. <laughs> and what we find is that the auditor, so whether you're audited by one of the big four or a smaller auditor matters for um, these top four features and for the width. Now, to give you more, some sort of an interpretable um, information to that, um, Companies which have a big four auditor have 12% more companies in sync offshore financial centers. They have 67% more companies in conduit offshore financial centers. Um, for those who don't know what sinks are, those are, for example, Bermuda, Cayman Islands. Conduits are um, Switzerland, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom. Uh, they have 17% uh, higher number of holdings and 14% higher number of management companies. So it matters whether you're audited by one of the big four or a smaller auditor. And the question is why? Um, I don't know. But uh, the hypothesis that uh, we developed is that by their, by their size and their global spread, the big four auditor are present in many more locations than smaller auditors. And this gives them access to um, knowledge about recent regulatory changes. And it gives them, and that hints back to the example of Luxembourg, it gives them information about, um, <coughs> um, no, it gives them access to the tax authorities in place. Basically, I need some water. <laughs> <coughs> So the, the increased knowledge intensity and the capacities to provide better services to their um, corporate clients is what we see behind these uh, numbers, what we suppose to be there. Okay, um, besides these results, we found some side things which are also of interest, but not at the core of the paper. We see that the auditor effect increases with the size of the companies. So bigger companies are more strongly influenced by the auditor. <coughs> and we found something else which is interesting, namely that um, companies which have their parent company in a sink jurisdiction, they make a higher use of other sink jurisdictions. Not of their own one, but of others. Yeah, that's something we, yeah, we don't really know how to interpret yet. What we do as a next step, um, it has actually been done this morning, but we look at uh, how the auditor effect varies from one country to another. So whether or not uh, big four uh, auditors, KPMG, Ernest & Young, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and Deloitte, whether they're more efficient in France than in Germany or 
in the UK than in Switzerland or in Brazil. So that will hopefully appear in the paper, uh, but not here yet. One minute. Okay, so um, I'll stop there for this paper, and I'll do some promotion of my PhD. <laughs> I want to do one part of it um, on um, the partners in accountancy firms, and I want to see how uh, the characteristics of partners changed over the last 20 years. So <clears throat> whether tax professionals have higher chances now to get in top positions. And um, there's also an interesting aspect that was raised by the Financial Times on how um, one of the big audit company, uh, co accounting firms um, now hired investment bankers for their top positions, something I don't really understand yet. Um, so I would like to trace these changes in access to top positions with Bordex data. And if anyone has experience with these data or anything else to say, I'm happy to talk about that later. <laughs>